it's under uh, section uh, 169 it replaces section 29 too and now it's it puts um, uh, the capacity of the judge to hold the youth in jail on less serious crimes on very uh, precarious uh, grounds and those grounds can be uh, based on the balance of probability so uh, a less serious crime might be shoplifting okay so the judge has to just state or, or the crown has to prove that um, they might do it again so they, they would use things like well he's done it before or he's done other crimes repeatedly so he might repeat this crime and this we're talking about indefinite incarceration for youth on even even things like uh, even things like um, the Safe Streets Act, they they already have provision right in there. That was the first time it popped up in my in my, in my experience was uh, this idea of they might commit a crime. So we're going to keep them in jail until we deal with this crime, even if they've never been found guilty. It's they might do it again. They've done it theoretically. They've done it a number of times. They haven't been convicted of it, but they might do it again, so we keep them in jail. And this, this is the same kind of thing. And this is a, a, a very s slippery slope because this is even looser than our traditional detention rules for adults, which required much better evidence, stronger evidence to to uh, to to uh, maintain ongoing detention. So this is very loosey goosey. You know, well, I think they might do it again. It's sufficient. To, to keep them, and God knows how long. And they don't, uh, in youth, they don't seem to have the same um, uh, d uh, processing rules as they do for adults. Like you have to be, you know, in front of a judge in so long, and a, and a bail in so long, and all that. That seems to be much looser, and it's supposed to be to give them more flexibility and whatever. But it, in fact, it, it uh, leaves it leaves leaves them open to be much more arbitrary and much more uh, abuse of authority um, if they don't have those guidelines set and uh, I think this is a huge slippery slope also I haven't uh, I haven't looked at it but the charges for for sexual offenses and all of that and recently uh, I, I saw a case where a man was uh, charged or, or uh, um, accused of assault with a weapon but on a summary basis so it wasn't a serious there was no injury and the, the procedure allowed the court to keep him incarcerated indefinitely um, if the victim said that they were afraid for their life. So even though there was no history of harm or, or attempted, you know, homicide or whatever, if, if they state that, and now apparently uh, that's being used as a, as, a, as a methodology for divorce because you can get the other person indefinitely incarcerated even if they didn't do anything just based on an accusation because if there's no injury there was no evidence given it was just a statement given by somebody and they put him in jail and kept him in jail for uh, almost four months until he finally got out so that's the kind of thing that you know it, it chips away at our constitutional rights to protection from arbitrary detention and we really have to stand on guard wherever it occurs whether it's the juvenile or whether it's in the other areas we need to to try and there was abuses even the way it was but we need to at least keep the the measure of, of reasonableness and fairness that we had already put in, in in our processes and and to try and maintain so i would say that alone would make a constitutional challenge just this section alone yeah and i, I think quebec is really going after that one because they have the the lowest uh incarcerated youth rate in canada and um, they tend to deal with the underlying yeah. issues a lot more or uh, attempt to anyway um, so Quebec is is really fighting on this one. I think I think, and uh, this is just a, what I've heard uh, that Quebec actually someone part of the maybe the bar association or somewhere uh, said that they're uh, they're not going to implement it. This the youth part. Uh, have you heard that? I heard that. Yes. I'm in the paper. I read yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. I can't remember exactly where, but. Okay, so basically this workshop we're going to talk about uh, the implications to different groups um, and also um, just how in our society, we, we have in our, our country, we've had a, a trend for many years now of eliminating the social safety nets um, in terms of social and health services 
um, in educational standards, and this has had uh, led to an increased neglect of our most vulnerable citizens. Um, and also, the next thing I'll talk about, Bill C-10, it doesn't address the, under, the uh, underlying issues. Um, it'll place people in jail for a longer time, deepening their already inequitable status in Canada. So we're re-marginalizing the already marginalized. Um, and I'm going to be using, I'm going to be talking about it, the social determinants of health. Um, I'll get into, and, and also talking about a uh, feminist perspective on this bill. Um, so, so that we can start to talk about how to move the, the focus of um, dealing with drug use and other criminal behaviors to dealing with the structural concerns um, that have led to crime in many cases. So why is it being implemented? I guess uh, if we're talking about why it shouldn't be implemented, we should first know why it is being implemented. Um, there, the number one reason is that it's a deterrent it's seen as being a deterrent uh, for already sentenced individuals by making an example of them, and uh, it will be a deterrent uh, for others as well. So it'll deter people who are already in jail under those sentences from committing further crimes and, and people who haven't committed crimes from doing it. Um, but evidence and experience, both in Canada and in the U.S., has proven that uh, min mandatory minimum penalties do not protect society, rehabilitate individuals, or contribute to the well-being of society. Uh, the former U.S. drug czar um, has encouraged Canada not to uh, make the same mistakes the U.S. made, and he cited the two mistakes were um, mandatory minimum penalties and insufficient uh, attention to social programming that rehabilitate people. Texas also, um, Texas, the governor of Texas, where they have the death penalty, and I think like uh, 20, someone someone said in the last workshop, 20% of their population is in One prison. out of 20. One, One out, out of 20, 20. Okay, thank you, uh, is in prison. Uh, and their governor has said, what is Canada doing? Like they're making a huge mistake that we've already made uh, that has nearly bankrupted the state and not reduced and it's important to say also that violent crime has continuously gone down in Canada. So we're not, we don't, we don't necessarily need to change whatever we're doing in terms of criminal justice. Um, maybe putting, probably putting more support supports in place, rehabilitative programs in place, actual.